So I'll go ahead and call the uh, Facilities and Operations Committee meeting to order. Um, if we can just go by and do some introductions. We'll start with my left. Uh, Liz Lars, Contracted General Counsel. Uh, my name is Ryan Kinsler. I use he him pronouns. I'm here um, as, a, as a, your, for your consideration for the uh, Bond Accountability Committee. Awesome. Uh, I'm Danny Cage, and I'm the student representative to the committee. Welcome. I'm Gary Hollins. I am the chair for the Facilities and Operations Committee. Uh, Amy Constant, board member. Dan Young, COO. Carol Bradshaw, executive assistant. Terry Parker, communications department. Awesome. So today we have uh, three items on the agenda. Uh, we have a couple reports and the acceptance of a new BAC member. Um, and so I will swing it over to uh, Mr. Dan Young. Yeah, and I'll just go ahead and turn it over. Our first item is the quarterly update from the Office of School Organization. And online we have our Senior Director of OSN, Marina Crestwell. Take it away, Marina. <laughs> no rush today, no rush. <laughs> wink, wink, wink. No. <laughs> uh, we have a, no presentation, just the written report that I've provided to you with a lot of materials. The quarterly report has um, all the materials from two BAC meetings. Um, prior to this, October and November, um, just a little bit of shifting around of dates, and we ended up uh, looking like they're one right after the other. But October 5th, we had our BAC meeting focused on modernization projects. Um, on November 29th, we focused on our infrastructure from the 2020 bond, our capacity projects from 2020, and health and safety projects from 2017. And we have shared all of those materials with you as part of our quarterly report, so you can go and see the project status updates for each of those. Um, couple highlights. Uh, uh, no news is good news on our modernizations, which is to say that um, Lincoln is moving along on schedule, um, still forecasting savings in the budget. Um, Benson and MPG are also under construction on schedule. Um, we have been discovering over and over and over again, underground dry wells at MPG. So we are um, definitely looking at our schedule for MPG, but we are continuing to, to work with that. And we do not foresee any impacts to the school year at this time. Um, Excuse in, me. Yes, right, so, so the acronyms, because I know we got some new folks. Can you just explain what some of those are? For folks. MPG is the multiple pathways to graduation building that is being built on the Benson High School campus. Thank you. Um, as far as our 2017 health and safety, um, we, as we've reported before, there are only a couple areas that we were still working on there. That's our asbestos, our lead paint, um, really had minor punch list items with security and um, we're continuing forward with our water quality uh, work as well. We are looking at our budget forecasts in lead paint water quality. Um, we anticipate getting savings back from those and we will direct those to other health and safety scope related work. But we're still looking at what those numbers are and so we, we're not quite ready to, to um, bring forward a recommendation on how to, to reallocate those funds within the other health and safety categories. On the 2020 program, um, we are Marina, can, can I ask a question about that? I was um, looking at that. You uh, specified lead paint and water quality. Does that, and that the funds may be, that were allocated to that maybe, or some of the funds may be allocated somewhere else. Does, does that mean that we're confident the lead paint and water quality issues at all schools have been addressed to the standard um, that we set? So what that means with lead paint, we had a specific list of areas that we needed to complete and we will complete the entire list of areas plus some. Um, for water quality, we have of course um, 
we've talked pretty extensively about the water filtration program that we have put together. And we are um, not just meeting what we promised, we are actually exceeding it in terms of the quality of the water that is being provided. Um, we are completing that work. We've got a little bit of outstanding work um, that we're going through. Currently, we anticipate the, just a very minor amount of work in January, um, potentially a little bit of lingering into February. And then we will be complete with everything we promised to do and um, significantly under budget. Great, great. Mm -hmm. I love hearing that. We do too. On the 2020 bond program, uh, we've, we've been um, doing more than just scratching the surface. Uh, one of the things that I pointed out to our BAC members at the last meeting uh, is that between September 1st and November 1st, we expended $22.7 million. That was in addition to the 16.5 million that we spent uh, with 2017 funds in that same time period. So in a two month time period, we, we put $39.2 million out into the community. Um, we are working very uh, fast and furious to get our projects completed. Um, and so you will see if you look at any of the pro project status reports for the 2020 prod um, bond program, there are a large number of projects in progress already, and we have been moving those forward as quickly as we can. Um, one thing of note, uh, in 2020 capacity, we have completed initial phase one of construction with Harrison Park Middle School conversion. Um, we are expecting to come in front of the board with a request to approve an alternative procurement for phase two. That is because we have, uh, as part of phase two, we're going to be doing a complete mechanical system replacement in addition to substantial work um, within classrooms, uh, within the um, gym, and in a number of different areas. And that work is, it, it has the potential to be extremely disruptive. Um, we would like to ensure that we have a contractor that can understand the scheduling complexity, um, the ability to mitigate impacts. And so we'll be looking for something other than a low bid. Um, we expect to see that coming forward in January. So it's just a little bit of preview that that's going to be um, heading your way. Uh, can I ask a question yes. about Harrison Park? Um, so when we um, earmarked about the $10 million in the 2020 bond for that middle school work, um, part of it was um, obviously in Southeast um, just opening up you know, Kellogg, which was a great new facility, but making Harrison Park also an attractive middle school program since those students hadn't had a middle, hadn't had a middle school experience for, well, that area for like 15 years. Are there, do we, have we cataloged or um, do we have a way to share with the community the sort of more student facing improvements we've made? Um, I think it's great we're getting, you know, a full mechanical rebuild, but the things like the gym, the classrooms, any like elective spaces, I, I know we have a, a covered bike area that, that was just recently put in, but in a way to share like, hey, you're, we, PBS is making an investment in making the school ready for middle schoolers as it opens next week. Yes, we have been doing those communications as well. We've had town halls, we have had community meetings and shared that information. Um, but to be clear, we've completed one phase at this point. In that phase, um, those were items that we could complete in a summer. And so there were limitations to what we could actually get done in a single summer. Um, what students um, saw as they came into the building at the start of the school year were um, essentially a, a refreshed entry area. Um, I say refresh, it's a little bit more than refreshed. Um, we certainly did address you know, finishes on the walls and the floor, um, lighting. We also added um, visibility from the office, the administration office into the front entry, which previously did not exist. You had to walk past walls and around a corner and into a door to get into the administration office. 
now Interesting. there's actually Great. Um, windows into the entry area and um, it's easier access into that office as well. That office did get, as part of um, revising that area, we refreshed some of the materials in that office too, did some work in the cafeteria as well. And of course, um, some things outside, including, you know, as you mentioned, the bike shelter uh, and some other work outside. That was relatively minor. We do expect to have significant, significantly more work. Um, the mechanical system, we highlight that simply because of the complexity of it, but we are going to be doing a lot more work that will be visible to students, to staff. So we will see new lighting. We will see um, obviously new paint. We will see new flooring materials. We'll see refreshed um, restrooms. And then there are some changes that we're making uh, in particular in accessing the, the gym and the secondary gym. Um, we will be making some changes to locker rooms and um, improving our all gender access to restrooms and locker rooms. And so there's, there's actually quite a bit of work that is involved um, and we do expect it to, to take two years to complete all of that work. Um, that said, the, the cost of everything as we know has gone up. Um, I think we've, we've said that pretty frequently. I'm pretty sure that's no surprise to anyone. Um, much as we would love that's to make this look like a brand new school, it's not a brand new school. We are doing everything we can while still trying to be um, fiscally responsible. And yet, you know, we're, we're still putting a significant amount of um, investment into the property to, to make it not just meet middle school ed specifications, but also to be really a, a clean, bright, fresh new space for students. Super appreciate it. going to be great. The more um, we can, you know, information flows to us we, that we can share with the community. Um, you know, parents right now are making decisions about where their students are going to go to middle school next year, <clears throat> the following year, and I think having that to show the investments is super important, and um, I'm delighted to hear there's so many student-facing improvements happening to that school. We are definitely excited about the improvements. We're, we're wishing that the inflation costs were not what they were. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's that's probably a you know a good note to kind of put out there for all of our projects. This is definitely something that continues to impact us. Um, I think we've all probably read um, in recent days that there there's a lot of belief that inflation might be starting to level out. Um, we're hoping uh, to see it level out a little bit more over this next year. Um, that said, we still we still have very high prices coming in. Uh, we are still seeing some supply chain issues. We're particularly concerned about uh, equipment, lead times for electrical equipment and mechanical equipment. And so we are working diligently to come up with creative solutions to that and hoping that we can continue to stay on schedule with um, the projects that we'd like to complete over this next summer. Um, particularly for our mechanical projects where we need to source that equipment. Um, in some cases, what we're hearing is 44 to 50 weeks ahead of time. Well, uh, we um, have another question. Yes. Oh, um, one of the things I was wondering, I can't remember, but does do, uh, PPS have a goal on, on ADA uh, accessibility? So we are, um, Specific to the bond, we do have funding set aside. We had funding set aside in the 2017 bond for accessibility improvements. We have utilized most of that funding already. Um, for the 2020 bond, we also set aside funding um, very specifically to address um, main level accessibility to meet ADA requirements. So um, that work cool. wouldn't... When we talk about main level accessibility, that's a number of different types of things. So it can include everything from um, pathways through the parking area to get into the building, um, to handrails, to um, access to classrooms, 
to restrooms, to ensuring that we have um, accessible restrooms on the main level. Um, there's a fair amount of work that's going into that. We are working on that as well. And there's actually in the packets, um, there is an update in the 2020 uh, bond uh, updates for the November meeting. You will find one specific to ADA. You will also find one specific to um, the special education uh, learning environment improvements. And if there are no other questions, I don't have any other updates. And it looks like that is perfect timing for our uh, BAC call. Awesome. Perfect timing. Yes, perfect yes, timing. I, I would say uh, I just wanted to add to your report, Marina, that I had the chance to go tour Benson construction site. And I would encourage everyone to do that. I'll take you, Tom. <laughs> Um, it is mind boggling, just the, the degree of complexity, the sheer size, the number of people on the job. Um, and everybody on the job says it is the most complex project they've ever worked on. Anderson says that flat out. Um, and the other really, really cool thing, which I told Gary last night, is there are a ton of Benson grads working on the job. Um, in all kinds of roles and trades, and that's pretty great. So it's it's. I encourage everybody. It's a it's cool. It's it's amazing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. For some reason, I thought it was four thirty. <laughs> I got here before four thirty. But I, when I got the card, realized I was like, oh, I immediately called Dad. So oh, yeah, he let us know. Uh, yeah, so. This not reflective of the quality of your entire tenure. <laughs> <laughs> As I said to Dan on the phone, what a way to finish. <laughs> hey, in the previous 10 years, I don't recall the same thing for Tom, so. Uh, yeah, no, not too often. Uh, anyway. All right, well, uh, so I'm here to present uh, the report for the BAC. And uh, this last period, we met twice. We met in October and review the modernization projects and then we met again in november to uh, review the 2017 health safety and the 2020 bond capacity and infrastructure and then we also got a uh, update on the progress of the of the planning recommendation that i believe has come to you for jefferson which was which that was last night, last night. yeah um so uh per the report you know we have we've been tasked to make sure we're uh, the OSM and the school district is, you know, kind of carrying out what was intended within the bond. And so there's a number of things that we focus on. Um, one is um, kind of the, the scope of, you know, what the intention of the bond. And clearly, they, <laughs> they're doing a good job of, of, of delivering what was intended for the, for the, for the, the three bond programs uh, to date. Uh, the budget is probably the area we focus the most upon. Uh, fortunately, they got through the pandemic and everything, and all the budgets look great right now. Uh, it appears there's going to be a, a significant un underrun in the 2012 bond. Um, you know, they, they still have some reconciliation of, of compensable costs between the bond as well as some other funding sources that were. Uh, also obtained to, to support the bond program, but it looks like there will be some uh, funding left over to maybe address some some things that uh, maybe at VE or I know in the 2012 bond uh, we didn't necessarily accomplish everything we had hoped to accomplish uh, with the, the roofing and some of those other projects. Although I'm guessing we're making progress. Uh, in the other programs. Uh, so how how will we determine that before close out of 2012? Because one specific question I have is, uh, you know, I saw your note, Marina, about the the shift of MPG from 2017 to 2020. Um, so I would think that that with pro with program contingency left over from 2012 before we we close that out, would we I mean, 
You could argue that it should go back to Benson because Benson was underfunded to begin. 20, 2012 is not Benson. 2012 oh, 20, 2017, right. Yeah, Got yeah. it. I was going to get to those two. Got it. Minutes. Sorry, sorry. But, yeah, but 2012, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I know there were some serious, I haven't been around through all of them. Uh, <laughs> there were some serious VE uh, efforts uh, early on by Franklin and so, Roosevelt. Well, quick, quick question. We have a new... Oh, value engineering. There you go. Thank you. Pets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to the jargon, I forget about it. I don't understand what I'm talking about. But in any case, there may be some opportunities uh, for to maybe correct some things in, this, in, the, in those schools that maybe didn't work out the way you we had planned. Uh, but I, I guess that's, that's for you all to decide once you kind of know how much funding is is uh, available within the 2012. Um, but right now, between all of the budgets, it's fairly sizable. It's forecasting a fairly sizable amount. What's like what? Um, 2012 was 438. Wow. Now, there's, you know, there's, there's 30 million of other funding that came into that bond program. So how much of that is Overrun, right. un underrun against the thirty million versus how much is underrun against the original bond? They came in from from what? From bonds, grants, sales, other, other oh. sources uh, that came in. You know, and we've done that. You've done that with all of your programs. So if you look at the if you'll look at the, uh, the report that we get, you'll see the original budgets for the what was approved in the in the bond measures, and then you'll see other funding sources mm -hmm. uh, that they've been able to do various means. Well, but they're all rolled together in, in one overall project. So when we when we see that it's underrun, we don't know how much of that is an underrun within 2012 versus how much is an underrun within the other funding sources. And that's something that, mm -hmm. that you know, once they get everything uh, closed out, they'll be in a better position to be able to talk more specifically about, okay, we have this much money available left within the 2012 uh, and I suspect there's, they'll, they'll be working on some potential projects that would still fall within the, uh, the intent of the bond program that you could still move forward with. But there, it's a little early uh, for that right now. The good news is it's not the reverse, <laughs> where you could be forecasting 400,000 overruns. So I would say it's uh, pretty positive. It, it would be good to um, make sure there's a, a user experience component to that process of prioritizing what projects need attention because we all know that there are some things that um, weren't necessarily value engineering but just didn't quite work out as intended um, in those original projects. So it would be good to really talk to the people in the buildings about right. um, what those are. Yeah, and that's not uncommon. Yeah. Uh, uh, the 2017 and uh, 2020, right now, I'm looking at them together because of the, the overlap between Benson. Uh, so combined, they look great. Uh, and, I, and I would say the projects, the, the 2017 projects, you know, Lincoln, Kellogg, McDaniel, uh, all are coming in under budget. So there's right now there's a projection of about between the three of them about a $10 million underrun. Uh, right now, Benson is tracking uh, on, on schedule. They've gotten through uh, the areas maybe with the highest risk of cost <coughs> uh, what they had shared with us. So that's, that's encouraging that they got through that phase without any significance. So right now, Benson is looking pretty good as well. So, you know, for the current budget. Um, and then uh, the overall 2020, uh, you know, the jury's still out on, on Jeff because we're still, you know, but the, the re regardless, if you look at the combined budget between 2017 and 2012, or and 2020, uh, there's currently forecasting uh, about 14 million right now under run. So, uh, and there's a, that's still, a, doesn't account for a fairly large program contingency mm -hmm. yeah. that isn't necessarily been um, 
determine how that's going to be spent. So I would say financially the project, the, the programs are in great shape uh, based on what, what we've seen. Uh, uh, specific to the, to the um, health and safety, yeah, that was $150 million that was uh, planned to be spent. There's still about 28, $22 million, almost 23 that hasn't been allocated yet. Uh, in the, but, you know, I'm sure that will, as they move forward, they'll, we'll take care of that. Likewise, in the capacity and infrastructure, uh, there's still another $95 million that hasn't been allocated yet. So, um, <clears throat> and, you know, they're running into some challenges with supply chain and something. So there may be, there's potential for some things not getting, uh, not, not accomplishing as much as they had planned because of funding. But certainly if the, the overall budget has, has sufficient funding, they're more than likely they can still complete everything that they, they intended to. Specific to uh, scope, um, I think I kind of mentioned they're so far so good. Uh, the, the challenging one uh, this, this, this last two years has been the 2020 with the curriculum and the even though we didn't review them, but you know, there's some compensatory issues with those. I think they sorted all those out. What do you mean? Well, not all of uh, IT work is compensable under a bond. Right. Similarly, not all curriculum is compensable under a bond. Right. Oh, like the professional development. Yes. Pieces. Yes. Right. So, so at first, uh, you know, it took them a while to, to kind of sort all that out. And I think they've got a pretty good handle now on what's bond uh, compensable and what's not, and when you may have to get other funding to uh, pay for those. Uh, so, but uh, do you? I'm, I'm yes. Maybe it's in these. I didn't, I didn't see it, but it may, it may be in there. Yeah. But um, for for example, take either IT or um, curriculum. Does it show up in your reports the total amount that's being spent and then has a like um, it differentiated out of what's um, paid for by the bond? It is in the reports that Marina. Uh, I, I don't go into that detail. I kind of try to summarize it. Uh, but yes, the reports that we receive from Marina uh, differentiates uh, you know, other funding sources for you know, both for curriculum and and for the IT that are intended to uh, fund the non-compensable uh, uh, work. So, could so I it is, step it is, it in is. real quick on that just to provide a little more context? Um, just to be clear, the bond program administration report we do report out on curriculum and technology as part of that, and we do differentiate between bond funds and other funds. That said. We, within those reports, we only utilize information that we have in eBuilder, which is our system. Um, curriculum has moved their non-bond funds out of eBuilder. <clears throat> so they're working solely through PeopleSoft. And we are not reporting those funds on our program administration report. However, when they provide their <clears throat> curriculum specific project status report twice a year, they bring with that report all of the information about their non-bond funds. So I just want to clarify, um, if you want an update on their non-bond funds, you'll need to do it from project status report, which um, the most recent one uh, should be from September. I'm, like, I'm going back in my head but I can certainly find that information and send it to you. Um, we should also have those on our website. Great, and you're saying so <clears throat> twice a year? You they report to the PAC. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> regarding uh, performance on schedule, um, the the only projects in the, in the bond that were kind of had specific schedules with a big modernization. The other programs, the schedules are kind of developed uh, depending on as they get scoped and so far. And so so for the modernization projects, so far they've you know they've made every one they you know 
there may be a little work to be done during the school year, but that's not uncommon uh, with a project of that complexity. So schedule has been, performance has been great. The other projects have been, uh, you know, most schedules have been, uh, been adhered to, but, you know, there are supply chain issues, some other things that are occurring right now that are complicating uh, the schedules for some of these health and safety and capacity projects. But, uh, they're, you know, they're doing their best to try to anticipate what those might be, and once they get them planned, uh, then they've, they've generally pretty successful in delivering them uh, on the schedules that they establish. Are we having any of those that lately that aren't getting any betters at all? Well, I think we've seen any finished recently that haven't had, had any carry over a year, maybe. Yeah. Uh, some roofing projects, for example. I mean, they're not, they're not um, from an overall bond program, they're not, uh, I wouldn't say, um, as big a deal as if you didn't open the high school on time. Um, <laughs> they're just, they're unique, small projects. You have some different bidding uh, client, uh, contractors you're dealing with. You have only a certain window you can work on many of the projects. So they're not as easy, uh, I mean, they're not, so there's some, some challenges with them um, that when you have a big general contractor managing a big program, that they're in a better position to kind of manage through those those things than a smaller contractor. And that's kind of what they're experiencing here. So. Um, we didn't really review any, uh, go into any detail on the audits uh, in the last two meetings. Um, they, we, do, we do receive the information on the audits. They're, you know, for the most part, most of the audits, uh, the, at least the past audits, Majority of everything has been addressed. There's a couple of little outstanding uh, issues. I think we had agreed that in a, this coming year that there would be an opportunity for the BAC to maybe dive in a little bit more with the audits to kind of figure out, well, how can we like, you know, like the first audit, I remember that one. Uh, it might, maybe it's time that we should have everything off the, the list on that one. But, but, but as Marina will attest, some of these recommendations aren't as simple as they would seem, given you know for a variety of reasons, and I and I can appreciate that having been in her shoes before. <coughs> the other thing that we focus a lot on is business equity, equity performance, and workforce equity. Uh, the business equity is is improving. Uh, we're still a little bit below the goal, but the encouraging news is the last last twelve months it's been at seventeen percent. So we're really close. So that's that's a good sign, which would indicate that the contractors and the, and the staff are really doing their best to try to you know, hit those targets. Likewise, on the workforce uh, equity, we're, we're you know, exceeding the, the goal. The female participation is a little low, but from what we understand, that's pretty much consistent with what other agencies are finding uh, that have similar goals. Uh, the schools. So, uh, not surprising that a lot of work, a lot of probably being made up in that area. It's going to take a while before we see you know, higher numbers, I think. Is that number, um, I mean, I'm not sure how much, how much lower you could get at 5%. <laughs> is, um, has that number changed at all? Is that, that's overall work force on the projects? Yeah, on the, yeah, I think it looks at both. No, workforce only looks at the construction side, if I'm, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Uh, because it focuses primarily on the apprenticeship goals. Uh, that's the easiest way to track it. I don't think you're tracking uh, total workforce participation. It's just construction. It's just, I mean, we're not tracking uh, all of the workforce, or are we? I'm trying to remember. Is it based on apprenticeship or is it just numbers? That's not just Maria knows the details better. So the workforce equity, the um, we have three components to workforce equity at PPS. One component is apprenticeship, which is a hard requirement number that our contractors are essentially required to have a certain percentage of uh, apprentices. Then beyond that, we have two other categories that are minority workers and female workers. And that is not specific to apprentices, that is also journey level uh, workers. And it is really tracking goals 
to get to a certain percentage of participation from either minority or female. Um, and there are um, different goal numbers for each of those. We have uh, done a, we are generally doing well with the minority. Um, we are uh, exceeding our apprenticeship. Um, the challenge has been the female workers and that challenge is consistent across all of the public agencies in the Portland area. The 5% is consistent and it's actually consistent across other agencies as well. It's, uh, I know the challenge, I had the same challenge when I was, uh, when I was in one place. Um, and it's the, the, the key based on you know, my involvement way back when um, is figuring out how to develop the pipeline. It, it starts in the schools. Um, it's, it's once there, and, and, and some of the information that uh, some groups we looked at, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of interest at the grade school level in STEM and all these things. And in junior high, all of a sudden, a lot of that changes. And so by the time they get to high school age, uh, you've lost them. In many cases, at least that was the information that I, that I was made available. So the key is how do you keep that momentum going in the junior high, like you could do with sports and some of the arts and other programs that support and keep uh, kids involved. And so that's where uh, obviously you have a tremendous opportunity to help improve those numbers over time. They're not going to happen overnight, but. That's my two cents based on my experience. Um, uh, it's just, it's hard. And along with that, that was kind of leading up to my last part of a report. We had a number of recommendations. You probably noticed we were, we had a, a guest come to our meeting to talk about, primarily she wanted to talk about the incident that happened at Benson, but also um, she had some some ideas that we all support towards kind of improving uh, some of these things would kind of carry over. And so one of them is the, the safe work workplace or environment. Um, I knew that, I know that was an area of interest with Kenichi. Uh, I know from my experience that that was a challenge uh, at keeping apprentice on the job because they weren't treated very well. And so to me, um, that's, you know, really important that your contractors continue to stress and that there's some, some mechanism to kind of judge how they're doing. Uh, and I don't know, how, that's not an e I mean, it's easy to say, probably not an easy thing to do, but obviously it, it's, it's crucial to growing your apprenticeship numbers and growing your diversity numbers. If they're not treated well, it's not a safe work environment. You gotta have a tough time keeping those people in the trades. It is, uh, do we have a point person within OSM who really works with those apprenticeship programs or is it just project, specific project personnel, a project to project basis? So we have hired somebody who is working um, with our business equity, workforce equity and um, career learning work. Um, that person is still, you know, getting up to speed on all the many different components of those different programs. But I did want to point out that uh, we are actually working, they are working with um, purchasing and contracting on respectful workplace language to be added to our contracts. Okay. And so we anticipate that will be getting rolled out very shortly. I have language in my uh, inbox, in fact, that I am supposed to be reviewing this week. <laughs> and who is this new employee? Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to say his last name incorrectly, and so I'm almost afraid to do that. But it's um, Avtar Stunavigora, uh, okay. I believe. And I'm just, I'm so terrible with names, and um, I'm almost embarrassed, so... It's all good. Thank you. I'm glad that uh, we have that person on board. Me too. And he's actually working very hard to to address some of the things that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. So we're looking forward to bringing some things forward to to the committee mm -hmm. at some point here in the upcoming mm -hmm. year. 
And um, in like in that job description, is there a is there a specific connection with our um, career and technical education people within the Office of Teaching and Learning? Uh, the job description itself is not specific to that. However, we are looking at how we can develop the program um, to to be a little more reflective of what we do with an OSM. Um, we do work with the career and um, technical education folks um, with their database, but frankly, OSM has always kind of gone above and beyond in terms of how we manage student engagement with our consultants and our contractors. And so we wanna put together a more formalized program within OSM that allows us to, to, to really kind of be more creative and, and think about it more intentionally as a department, as opposed to each individual project um, working through things on their own. Yeah, I think that's really important. I agree. Um, and I, I mean, just to note that from our perspective, we are, um, what we want more than anything else is to get more students working in design and construction. Like that is, that is the nature of what we do. It's, um, it's what we love. It's what we are passionate about. Um, it, it's what helps our environment, our industry move forward. Um, and so it is near and dear to our hearts and you will find that all of our project managers work hard to engage students as part of the projects and to give them the experiences um, to determine if these are our career fields that they want to go into. Okay, a couple other recommendations uh, that she had suggested that we would concur with is, you know, to the extent that you can, I know statutes don't always allow it, but where you have a contracting process that has a competitive proposal type approach as opposed to just a hard bid, uh, that perhaps there's uh, workforce equity criteria as one of the uh, part of the evaluation in selecting a con Absolutely. contractor. Obviously, you can't do it on all pro contracts. Uh, and then uh, we were thinking that there would be some way to get kind of periodic updates on how are we doing with the apprentice uh, workforce and diversification? And you know, we just see a rolled up numbers. I don't know if you get any detail, but I think it might be useful to see, you know, more, a little more breakdown. Not every, not every report, but periodically just to say, well, here's how we're doing, as opposed to just this one rolled up number. Uh, you had mentioned this earlier, Amy, the, you know, how we're going to, what's the process for the un unutilized funding? Uh, that needs to be a, uh, set up. We don't normally see the risk log, um, uh, and so it might be beneficial for periodically to, for OSM to share that in some fashion. It was a confusing a little bit at times when we would see forecast with an underrun, uh, but then we had said, oh, we're, and there's contingency they're holding on to because we have this, this risk. Um, it's like, oh, Okay, well, that's good. I'm glad you have the risk log. And, but I think it would be might be useful to just to kind of have a sense yeah. of what are the risks right. and, and how do they affect the project. Because each project, I mean, I've been on a project steering group and they have that and they, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's very explicit. Like what's, what's left to do on the job and what's the level of risk there yeah. to the contingency. And then I think Dan's already been working on it, but I had to say it one last time, and that is recruitment of BAC members. I understand <laughs> that, that, that we have one here today. Uh, but yeah, it's been a little uh, frustrating this last year. There's really only about four of us that have been regularly attending the meetings. Um, and as it turned out, all of our terms were up. Oh. <laughs> Fortunately, Dan was able to convince two to stay on. and. Uh, he didn't ask me, but I figured he didn't want me anymore. <laughs> I was surprised I lasted 10. Now it's only supposed to be eight. It's our whole bond program. I know. In fact, I was, we were joking about the last meeting about, I think Dan and I were the only ones in the room that were here at the beginning. Uh, I'm pretty wow. close. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, also, just a report number 38. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I didn't write all of them. I only over the last two years. Kevin, Kevin did all the rest of them. Oh, no, I think this report is so great. I shared it with the climate um, committee, community committee, as like a way to report to the board. I think it's a great template just of like, what here's what you've been charged to do, and here's well, your observations. Well, all the credit goes to Mr. Young here because he's the one that suggested this new format, which I was pleased uh, with as well because when I first took over uh, the chair I was like oh is there is there any specific way you'd like us to report things as opposed to us just kind of at, at random kind of thinking about what these what, what kind of what come, comes to mind so yeah this has been very helpful to provide some guidance um, and uh, it wasn't surprising when I read it being a him being a planner, <laughs> but I happen to be on the Clackamas County Planning Commission. So it looked very, very similar to the way we see uh, uh, planning reports. Uh, what, well, land use standards have been all, all since the world else. <laughs> anyway, so I was like, ah. Uh. Uh, two other kind of shout outs since uh, we were really impressed with the process that was being utilized for Jefferson uh, Public Outreach. That uh, it was a great process. Uh, and it, and it ultimately, I think, led to a, a you know, very good recommendation. Uh, I mean, it was, it was kind of an obvious one to me, but it just was great that it was validated by the process that you went through. Uh, similarly, we were, I was pleased to hear that the Creative Sciences Seismic Upgrades was an immediate occupancy, which is not something um, that's been done much in the past, but, and having been on Having actually worked on the Oregon Resilience Plan, uh, this is a great step forward, and I would hope the district would continue to set those types of goals for your seismic improvements. Because, uh, anyway, and then last but not least, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's been a great ten years. Uh, surprised that you kept me around that long, uh, <laughs> but it's been fun working with staff. It's been fun watching. Uh, the OSM team develop and, and become the first rate organization that they are. Uh, and it's, and uh, as I shared at the last meeting, uh, in my, early on in my, my career, when I was a consultant, I actually worked on a lot of schools, uh, uh, some high schools and junior highs and colleges and whatnot. So it's kind of fun. I started out on schools and kind of ending my, uh, my uh, career with schools. So uh, it's been a great run. Well, thank, you're, you thank you. Your expertise has been immensely useful and just your dedication and commitment. And really, if you want to go out and see um, Benson, for example, <laughs> I don't know if you've been in Lincoln. I've been in Lincoln. Yeah, okay. Um, it's, uh, we should, I, let's I make sure that happens. And you should come too, Ryan, to get your feet wet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're to get me, your feet muddy, I guess. <laughs> as they are the final product. Say that again? Uh, I say it's just as interesting to see the projects during construction oh, as yeah. to see the final product because I'm an engineer and you build things. You want to see how things come together. So to me, that's just, just as interesting. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I love the opportunity and, and also Jeff and Cleveland when you get around to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Open invitation. Yeah, anyway, yes. Anyway, that's my report. We're Thank you so it. much. Thanks for indulging. Fantastic. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Does anybody have any other any questions before he goes? Comments? We'll just thank you. Thank you for everything. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Next agenda. All right. The last one is about VAC membership, and I'll just start. Uh, just want to say, I really appreciate Tom the time you spent here. I remember the very first BAC meeting, which I don't know the date, but it's darn near almost exactly ten years ago. So wow. uh, I remember that meeting uh, and all the expertise and the guidance that you gave me offline as well throughout the years is always very greatly appreciated. You're always really the steady hand on the committee, so we'll miss you for sure. So thank you. Um, in your packets is a, is a brief staff report about our BAC membership. We do have.
new individuals trimming off, uh, and we have some positions. Uh, we did do uh, a public recruitment, and we did some target recruitment as well, which we continue to do because to, to fill some positions. Um, but there are two uh, committee members, uh, as Tom referenced, who have been on the committee for two years: Greg Gilaretto and Norm Dowdy. They have been uh, very active, uh, very supportive. Uh, high quality feedback from both Norm and Greg, uh, and we would love for them to continue on with the committee. They're both willing to continue on uh, as well. So uh, we would like to recommend that they have a second appointment. And then we also have two new potential applicants. One who couldn't make it today, his name is Jonathan Trett. Uh, he works with uh, Home4. Uh, by pure coincidence, I, ran, I knew him 15 plus years ago when he was with Northwest Housing Alternatives. He has been around the affordable housing uh, world and land trust world for a very long time, a uh, very sharp individual. Uh, and then we have Ryan uh, Kinsella. I think I can get him. Kinsella, yeah. I think it, yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, who is with uh, Oregon Metro right now, uh, has a lot of great background in, uh, in capital projects, uh, in finance in particular, and I'll let Ryan talk a little bit about himself. Yeah, thanks for having me today. Uh, again, Ryan Kinsella, and um, I'm currently the director of capital asset management at Oregon Metro. Um, it's a position I started just uh, six months ago, but um, spent a good portion of my career at the city of Portland um, and was in the budget office for a number of years, worked with large infrastructure bureaus on development like their capital plans and the financing budgeting around that. Um, and then eventually uh, worked my way up to the deputy director role at the budget office um, and then pivoted over to the finance director role at the Portland Bureau of Transportation, um, where I spent the last few years um, <laughs> helping them manage their their finances um, through a pretty precarious environment um, and the development of like, their overall capital plan and um, and then just recently started at Oregon Metro. So I'm really excited the, about the opportunity to, to join the, the Bond uh, Accountability Committee. Um, I've got to say, I mentioned at the end when we were having some of our initial conversations, I've been on the staff side a lot of accountability committees um, and have done the prep work and know, you know, just the importance of, um, you know, as the committee comes together, there's some important conversations have that happen there, but there's a lot of really important critical work that goes to bring those conversations to head and to being able to have those conversations um, at the committee level. So um, I really do value sort of that, that, that critical part of the process and know that there's really good work and, and uh, checks and balances throughout the development of capital plans and uh, bond work, but, um, but having the community's input and that uh, external oversight is really important as well. So thanks thank you for yeah. your service. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to work with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you I'm sensing yeah. Andrew Scott uh, sent you here. Uh, I, Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> now we're Andrew at the budget office. <laughs> All right. Do we have to? Do we to recommend him to the board? I think it'd be great if, if you guys would if you make a recommendation, okay. and then we would put it on the next board consent agenda. Right. For both of them. Yeah. yeah. In, in and the Edward Duels for uh, Norman's Greg as well. Yes. Okay. So we're going to give a head nod as agreeing to. Fully supportive. Supportive. Don't get moved to the board. All right. Sounds like that's what we're going to do. Like that's it. Okay. Any questions, comments for. I don't want to mess up your name. What was it? Ryan? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put that Ryan. Okay. Well, if any other questions, I have one no, no, announcement that's something to talk about a little bit. Um, so coming from the conversation we had last night um, with, and we met with the board leadership and superintendent executive team, ELT, ELT yeah. folks. Um, so one of the things that um, was recommended um, that we bring the purchasing and contracting procurement stuff to this committee and we can start diving into that information there. Um, I'm going to try to I'll work with Dan as far as what stuff we're going to need and then put it on the agendas um, to start having those conversations. And then as we get further down the road, um, we'll have a board uh, work session around those and then see how that works into policy and all that stuff. So, Dan, do you need Emily as part of that? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm happy to refer it. Yeah. So and I just wanted to make sure I just brought that up. So. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you saw my note, but I uh, I would like to know more about the role of NAMAC and the contract that we have with them. There, uh, we do have a professional services contract with them to help us with some of the stuff. But to be honest, it hasn't really been utilized yet. 
So like I had suggested that they facilitate um, a work session, which would be great down the road. But if we're going to start here with kind of combing through the the policies and areas where we can make change, you know, maybe we do need to do a little groundwork first. But I'd, I'd like to know, you know, I'd like to see the scope, which I, I think I saw a long time ago when I was trying to get the contract put in place and then understand what they're doing or what they're not doing or what they could be doing. Um, and I'm with Guadalupe circled up with you, Dan, yet that your email came up in the meeting this morning yeah. and we agreed that that would be put in the mix of the a pretty wide-ranging multidimensional discussion. So okay. that was noted in the meeting this morning. So in terms of scope, I have sort of like two, two big areas. Um, there is sort of the you know the day-to-day -day contracts that cover a whole variety of things. It's on the facilities and bond side, and then it's all the professional service contracts. So we have so there's all that, and that seems one. And then um, we have our really big modernization um, contracts, and I'm curious just because just well given the timing and the uniqueness of the Jefferson project of better understanding like how exactly we're going to approach that um, either differently than we approached other other projects um, or not just it seems like now is the moment to have that conversation but it seems somewhat different than the you know five hundred thousand dollar contract for professional services you know type contract um, it's just bigger and way more complex. So, so I, I'm wondering, is that would that be within scope period of what? Yeah, there was a way, so that'd be all in, inclusive of that of those conversations, um, construction, bidding, purchasing, contracting, and then the non-construction bidding and purchasing stuff. So we just want to look at the whole uh, process as a whole and see, you know, where we're. See what it is. Well, I think a lot of folks don't know exactly what that looks like, how it works, how it operates. How do you go from you know doing your solicitations all the way to getting awarded a contract? You know, I think so. I think as we look into the totality of the property procurement process, um, then we can start getting into those um, more individual conversations around this contract versus that contract. Um, going from there, but I definitely it's a conversation that needs to be had uh, when I look at the numbers, you know, um, and going based on the current rate that we've been going on, um, you know, and I mentioned this this morning, you know, we have almost $2.4 billion worth of contracts. And then when I broke it down by the numbers that I seen from the reports, you know, we got around $394 million that's going to certify firms. Well, then that gets split up between minorities, women, emerging small businesses as well. So, you know, so that still leaves two point eight, two point almost two billion dollars over two billion dollars that's not going to certify firms. And so we are talking about, you know, the gaps, wealth gaps, and education gaps. We'll never get close to closing those with these type of numbers. Um, and so this is just from the you know, preliminary numbers that I looked at from the report that you guys sent in, and I didn't want to go too much into it today. Um, but, you know, we'll have those conversations. And then I have a, I did have a lot of questions, but I didn't want to bring it here, so I will send them out. Um, and then we can kind of start that conversation moving forward. When you think about a burn rate of nearly $40 million in three months, like that's an enormous economic impact. Um, we're not going to continue at that pace, but still, um, it's a huge impact in our community. So, um, any, other, any other questions, comments? Anything good for the order? No. Welcome, Welcome, Ryan. Uh, any public comments? There's not any public comments. All right. Well, we'll, we'll adjourn the meeting. Almost at 5:05.